Let's hear it for Liv. Thank you, Carl. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Liv Erickson. You may know me as Miss Livy Rose. I am a developer evangelist at Microsoft, and I'm really, really excited to be here talking to you today about developing for HoloLens. Uh, this is particularly near and dear to my heart because two years ago, almost exactly, I had my very first VR experience at SVVR number 15. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here now talking to all of you um, about another thing very dear, near and dear to my heart, which is HoloLens. Um, so I'm going to jump right into this because I've got about 10 minutes to teach you as much about HoloLens development as possible. So we're going to start by defining mixed reality. Um, everyone in here is pretty familiar, I think, at this point with virtual reality and this artificial environment that surrounds us and kind of changes our senses so that we can be teleported into an entirely different world. And then we're also fairly familiar with our physical reality, which is the state of things as they actually are. Um, but as all of us in here are experiencing in the work that we're doing or as enthusiasts in the VR community, um, there's a lot of blending between those two different realities and those digital realities are more and more often becoming um, very, very real to us. So in between both of these two types of reality falls mixed reality, which is blending those physical and virtual worlds. And with that comes the HoloLens. Um, so the Microsoft HoloLens is a fully untethered, self-contained holographic computer that lets you see holograms in your physical world. Uh, holograms enhance the real world. You can create whatever your imagination brings and make those real in the environment around you. They interact, you can interact with them. They behave just like physical objects with the exception that they don't have any truly physical properties. So you can do some pretty fun stuff with that. Uh, so with that, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what a self-contained holographic computer kind of looks like. Uh, it's more powerful than a typical laptop, but the HoloLens doesn't require any additional external PC to power the holograms that you're seeing. It's not connected to a phone, it's not connected to a desktop, so you can move freely around, walk around a room. Everything is do being run on the device itself. Uh, the HoloLens contains a whole bunch of different sensors. Uh, that capture information about what you're doing and the environment that you're in and then lets you interact with that via things like spatial mapping. It's got a couple of environmental cameras, a depth camera, an RGB photo and video camera, a few microphones, light sensors, a whole bunch of really cool technology going into one headset to provide a very uh, advanced computing device to bring those mixed reality experiences to life. It's got a set of transparent lenses so that you can still see everything in the world around you with the addition of those fun little holograms. It's got a holographic processing unit in it that is um, processing all of that spatial data and understanding it so that the computer that you're wearing on your head is understanding as much about your environment uh, as you do and in some cases a little bit more. Uh, it's got some spatial sound so that you can hear uh, holograms as if they were physical objects uh, emitting noise in the world around you. And it's really immersive, but you can still hear what's going on in that world around you. So you have this blend of that mixed reality experience that's both visual and audio. So developing for Windows Holographic, it is Windows. Uh, Windows Holographic Applications uses the Windows Universal platform. All holographic apps are Windows Universal applications that are made to run on the HoloLens device specifically. So if you're familiar with something like Unity, you can use Unity and develop for the Windows Universal platform to create these mixed reality applications. Uh, there are two major types of uh, mixed reality applications that you'll see with the HoloLens. You'll see them being 3D immersive applications, but also 2D flat applications that you can pin to your walls and use and interact with like you would an application running on your desktop. So the ecosystem for Windows Holographic is Universal Windows Platform. It's got the options to build with Unity, DirectX, you're using Visual Studio, and it's all coming through uh, the Windows Store as a distribution platform. So HoloLens provides a lot of new ways to interact that are different from how we experience a typical computing device today. We have the combination of gaze and gesture to interact with and contextually understand what we're looking at in the holographic world. 
We have the addition of voice commands, which are powered by the same search engines that run all universal Windows applications. You have the ability uh, to spatially map the environment that you're in so that your application can utilize information about the space around you. You have that spatial sound and a world coordinate system, so applications and uh, holograms remember where they have been placed in your real world, and you can continue to work with that. I had a talk a couple about a month ago in the Microsoft Reactor up in San Francisco, which is where I'm based out of, and I was wearing my HoloLens the other day and walked in and I go, oh crap, I forgot I left an elephant over there. And everyone in the office looked at me like, what is she talking about? <laughs> uh, so you've got this really powerful set of tools available to you through the holographic computer and through HoloLens that lets you build these applications that stay in your physical world. So. Uh, you have a number of different levels of these applications. First is the app experience that hopefully all of you will go out and build. You have uh, what makes up your holograms in the forms of 3D models, materials, the scripts that are defining those behaviors, textures that give it different appearances and a look and feel. Uh, and then below that, you have the open source Hollow Toolkit, which is a package that contains a lot of things that will help making holograms even easier. You've got prefabs for cursors that understand when they're interacting and engaging with a hologram. Uh, you've got prefab objects for sharing, so you can do shared space mixed reality applications, things that uh, help you understand and utilize the spatial mapping capabilities and other uh, utilities and test uh, components that will help you develop your holographic application. And of course, under all of that are the window holo Windows holographic APIs, which are what supports the gaze, gesture, voice input, and so forth. So when you're building 2D or 3D applications for HoloLens, you have a couple of different options. For 2D applications, these are experienced as 2D windows that you can place around your environment and work across multiple different device types. So if you're building for the Universal Windows platform, you can build these 2D applications to run on a Windows phone or a laptop or a tablet or the HoloLens. Uh, and you can really kind of look at this experience as going beyond the screen. Uh, you can build these with any of the Universal Windows platform tools in Visual Studio, so C Sharp, Visual Basic, C++. Um, they're usable from a variety of different devices, hands-free computing, and it's pretty easy if you have existing Windows Store content um, to be able to make those run on HoloLens using those APIs. Holographic applications that are three dimensions uh, are, can be experienced as those 3D holograms that surround the users. So much more of this immersive experience where things come to life in your physical world. Uh, so you're utilizing tools that are taking advantage specifically of those holographic APIs, and you have the option to do things like build them in C++, DirectX, or Unity. And with these, you're really utilizing that space and taking full advantage of the capabilities that the HoloLens presents you, and it's a really, really compelling and powerful experience. Uh, there are also a number of developer tools to help you get started building today. Uh, you'll need a few things that are available for free from the Microsoft Developer Resources. Uh, you can get Visual Studio 2015 with Update 3. Uh, you'll need Windows 10 Pro or Enterprise Education to run the Holographic Emulator. And uh, with that, you can start building, even if you don't already have a HoloLens device, because the emulator will let you uh, test your application as if it is running on the HoloLens. You can utilize things like simulated spatial mapping, understand how those holograms will look, and you don't uh, need to be building your two-dimensional apps using Unity. So it's really up to you. There's a lot of different potential options that you have as a developer for how you want to present your applications and also how you can start building those. So if you want to get started and learn a little bit more, because I can't unfortunately uh, stand up here for hours and hours to talk about this in depth, uh, go to dev.windows.com slash holographic where you can download all of the tools for building for HoloLens today. Uh, there's also a Holographic Academy series that has nine tutorials that will walk you through the process of building gaze and gesture into your holographic applications, understand spatial mapping, do that shared type of holographic experience for um, multi-user apps. You can get sample code from an open source project that Microsoft built called Galaxy Explorer, and you can get the Hollow Toolkit on GitHub. Uh, if you want to learn more about HoloLens, you can do so at hololens.com and go to forums.hololens.com to talk to other developers who are creating this. But that's enough talking right now, and I'm going to jump in and show you a really quick demo of a project that I'm working on right now. So I'm going to switch over here. Oh, it worked. Perfect. It kind of, maybe it kind of worked. Let's try doing this. Cool. Uh, so 
I am really interested in figuring out how we can use mixed reality to do different types of data visualization. So I took voter turnout data from the past 30 years and visualized how the different states did in terms of their voter turnout percentages. So what I have here is a pretty basic uh, hologram of the US that will update the color of the different states based on the percentage that their state saw in the voter turnout for the elections as the uh, user slides between different election years. These are all presidential election years, and this is an older build because this is a project I'm actively working on. Uh, if you want to get more information about this specifically, come talk to me afterwards. Um, but what I really like about this is that it's kind of uh, an application that showcases just one potential use of mixed reality to understand data in ways that previously I hadn't really been thinking about or considering, and in a little bit of a more fun and intuitive way than just sorting through a whole bunch of uh, text. So with that, I think I'm just about out of time. So I'm going to do, um, I'll be here, so I'm gonna do Q&A after all of the talks go by and I'll just come find me if you have other questions. Uh, with that, I wanna say thank you all so much. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this. And I am based out of San Francisco's office, so if you are around this area locally, I am more than happy to uh, catch up and meet with you and chat and talk more about all of this. Uh, so with that, thank you so much, and I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you so much. You brought HoloLenses for everyone, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. It's going to work. It's going to work. It worked. It worked. Okay. All right. With that, I'm going to hand it over. Please welcome Andrew Walkingshaw from Jumped. Evening, everyone. How are you doing? Hope you're all having a good evening. Uh, I'm Andrew Walkingshaw, uh, and I'm a data scientist here at Jaunt, which is a fancy way of saying I count things for a living. Um, but before that, I was a mineralogist, a mineral scientist. So that's why there's some rocks on here. So the question is, what on earth am I doing standing in front of all you at the R meter, apart from being terrified? And the answer is less flippantly, what I do is I build products, services, and infrastructure around large volumes of data, which is admittedly not really VR. But as an industry, we talk a lot, and rightly so, about new user interfaces like the HoloLens, about new technologies also like the HoloLens, about changes in manufacturing that mean you can affordably build things like the HoloLens. <laughs> So all of this stuff is like, these are all tremendously important forces that are in industry. If mobile phones hadn't come along, if GPUs hadn't gotten fast, we couldn't do any of this stuff. So our industry couldn't happen without any of these technologies, and we should talk about them. But also, we as an industry are building client-server applications. We're giving rise to very rich data sets enabled by VR. And we can build rich experiences out of those too, and I'm going to talk about one of those tonight. And I'm going to talk about using data to translate VR experiences to the web. How can we use what we know about how people watch 360 video when they're wearing a headset to bring those experiences to the web? Because the thing about cinematic VR, and John is very much a cinematic VR company, is that it's a no compromise, highly intimate experience. So what's going on here is uh, the girl on the right is watching Five Seconds of Summer, they're a favorite band. And it's like she's in the room with them and she was in tears. I mean, this was a hugely emotional experience for her. Because that sense of immediacy and intimacy and closeness that you get when you're in the same room with someone is, is a hugely powerful thing that VR brings. And to that end, we technically don't make many compromises. We build our own cameras, we have our own computational photography pipeline. High fidelity, high resolution in headset stereo video. Uh, ambisonic or Dolby Atmos audio, positional audio, all of these are things we do to get that sense of immersion. And the problem is you can't deliver that experience on the web. Not directly. We do what we can. Uh, for instance, we've recently brought Ambisonic Audio to our web player, which helps a lot. Ilya, who's standing over there, waving, uh, he put Ambisonic into our web player, and that's a huge deal. So we're doing everything we can to bring the parts of the experience that we can to the web. But it's not the same as wearing a headset. It doesn't feel like you're in the room. But there are some real advantages to web video as well. You don't need a VR headset. So that means you can send a link to someone via Messenger or send them an email, and they can click on it and they can immediately see it wherever they are. And that's critical because that's how content spreads socially. And these days, if content doesn't spread socially, it doesn't spread. 
So if you're a VR content company, you have to be a web content company as well. So we at Jaunt need to make our content good. We need to make it native, not only in the headset, but on the web. And the challenge with 360 video on the web is the navigation. So the premise of 360 video is that you can look anywhere, and that's fantastic. And when you're, when you're wearing a headset, it is, because you can actually just look anywhere. It feels really natural. It's a really obvious control scheme. But when you do it in a web browser, you click and you drag, and you click and you drag, it's like you're on a hamster wheel. It is, no joke, a drag. <laughs> so how can we get the ease of use of the web and the immediacy of the web and the lean back experience of the web while still keeping what's good about 360 video? And this is where I hope the demo works. It's also where I can't drive my volley screens. Aha! So many of you will be familiar with Invasion from Baobab. Fantastic piece. So this is on our website right now. And the entirety of this talk is that little logo that's almost off the edge of the screen on the right there. So we're actually launching a product tonight. This is John Compass. And what it is, is a better way of viewing videos on the web. Look, no hands. So the camera's moving for you. And what it's based on is not, we've not programmed this, there is no human intervention, this is learned, this is machine learned from people watching this video in headset. What we're doing is computing where the major points of interest are by the collective attention of people who've watched this video and using that to guide the camera throughout the scene. Wow. And many of you are familiar here, like, here there's only really one point of interest because, you know, bunny versus alien. But in a moment, the bunny's going to run behind us. It really is. I should have done my timings better. <laughs> here we are. Bunny runs behind us. And now there's two points of interest. And you'll see here, there are two points of interest. And you can just jump between them like this. Or you can just click on them with the arrow keys. So this will automatically work out whenever there are a bunch of people looking at something and put a camera there which you can immediately jump to or move to with one click, and it's completely automated. So we think that's a cool way of viewing 360 videos. It's a lean-back experience, it's much more relaxing, and it's much more web-native to press play and have the right thing happen. And if you want to just go in and you know watch it like you were previously and click and drag, you can just do that, and it's great, and it'll show you where you are, which is something you really lose in 360 video as well. You don't have a sense, a physical sense, of what way you're facing, so it's really easy to look the wrong way. But if you ever want to just jump back to the most interesting thing, like here, you can just click on that and the bird's going to come in and... Hey guys, what do your keys work? <laughs> Put that. <laughs> so the key thing we're doing here is... Well, it's gone off the top. What it says is we're learning from in-headset users to make the experience better for users on the web. So we're delivering a different experience on the web, but it's one that's very informed by the in-headset VR experience. Thank you. I'll hold it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing that goes that hard. So the key question here is can users tell us what's worth looking at in a video? And there's three key questions there. Where are people looking? Like what direction are they looking in, pitch your and roll? How many distinct points of interest are there in any given second mm -hmm. of the video? And how do those points of interest move over time? And this is in machine learning parts, the spatiotemporal <laughs> clustering problem. Now, many of you will be familiar with heat maps. Uh, many of the VR video platforms out there, including us on Facebook, provide videos, uh, provide a relatively detailed analytics to our publisher partners and to our creative partners about what's going on in the video. Uh, there's a blog post here by Cuba Mikowski, who's one of our publisher partners about his experience with joint heat maps, and a lot of editors are finding this super useful in terms of getting an insight into how people actually behave in VR content, and we were discussing this just before the meeting started, but there are a lot of psychological principles which carry over from traditional movie making into VR, but many of the literal principles don't precisely because of the freedom of action, and VR analytics, things like heat maps, are one of the crucial things for allowing that. But the challenge with this is it's not directly actionable. You can't really just overlay a heat map on the video in 2D and expect the general public to make sense of it. So turning that into something actionable is where machines come in. So what we do is we take the aggregate, anonymized headset trace data of people who've watched the video, apply some machine learning. That gives us an aggregate attention model. And that turns into ultimately automated camera moves like you just saw in the demo. 
So what we're doing is we're building a machine learning model and using that to guide the user experience. And you always have the ability and the right to just grab it and look wherever you want. But the model stays there to inform you if you're missing something and to enable you to easily always jump back to like a good central point so you can navigate from there if you ever get lost. So we're announcing tonight Drawn Compass. It's a machine learned, uh, back, thank you. It's a machine learned spatial temporal attention model of a headset display data from views in the Drawn tab, leading to a new user experience for viewing 360 video on the web. Uh, it's live now on our website for these four titles, and it'll be coming soon to many, many more. So you can go and have a look at these now on drawnvr.com and it will work. Probably not a mobile phone, sorry about that, but try it on your laptop. And the key thing here is that everyone deserves a great experience, native to the platform that they're on, whether that's a VR experience in headset or a video experience on the web. So thank you very much for your attention. If you want to get in touch, that's my details. It's great having a cheering section, isn't it? And one last thing is, if you're interested in stuff like this, we're hiring, johnvr.com slash careers, and we have uh, various people here from John, from our recruitment team, who are waving over there. So if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, or if you're a designer, or any of the disciplines across VR, because we work across all of them, of course we work in hardware, we work in cinematography, we work in computational photography, we work in data science, we work in web services, and we work in mobile applications. We're really interested in talking to you. Uh, thank you very much. If you've got any questions, uh, I'd love to have a go answering them for you. Thank you. I'm just, cur I'm just curious, when you're looking at the most, finding the most frequently viewed points, are you using the uh, K-nearest uh, neighbor algorithm? It's uh, related to K-nearest neighbors, but it's uh, a little more complex than that. Uh, you, in particular with headset data, you have problems with outlier, detect, outlier rejection, which means that k-means doesn't really give you optimal results. Okay. Arguably, the analytics you're collecting will organically give you the correct focus points. So are you uh, planning on giving the author, the content producers, a way to override that and perhaps explicitly... With, so that's what Facebook are doing with the system that they've announced, is you can punch in directions that they announced that about a month ago. Yeah, we're very open to that. There are certain times when directors are going to want to make creative decisions, and it's certainly not the place of a data scientist to insert himself into that discussion. The creative process is sacrosanct. There's absolutely no question about that. But when you look at a video like one of the demos that you'll see if you go to our website is Zoolander. And that's a piece where there are literally eight or ten points of interest around you because you're at the center of a fashion trade that's going on and all the runways are pointing towards you. And you wouldn't be able to go through and mark that up by hand because there's eight or ten interesting things happening at once and they're all moving around. So in a situation like that, you have to have a machine learned approach because nothing else is really scalable. So it's one of these situations where both techniques have value. Hope that answers your question. They absolutely could, but it would take them a very long time. So it may, it may not may, you know it may not make sense for them to do that. But if somebody wants to go through the process of doing that, that's certainly something we would be happy to talk to, talk with them about it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's... Okay. I'm interested in knowing where the ID come from. Is it like from user testing that they require to have this kind of view on the web? or is it like something you came up with and you're waiting to, to see how the user responds to this kind of interactions? Because that's coming back from 360 to natural classes. Right. So, so the data that builds our model comes from in headset watching. Yeah. I mean, where did the idea of the uh, feature came from? Oh, the idea of the feature came from, actually, we had a hackathon. Okay. Uh, we had a hackathon. It was a, a thing of, can we turn this into like a better 2D experience? Because we... We have this data and we're using it for heat maps and is there a way of making this more actionable? And we do have various other applications in mind. Uh, we think there are very interesting analytics applications here. We think we can build really good tools for directors out of this and that's something we're very excited about. And there's a few others that are earlier and are not in a stage we can honestly talk about yet. Because having this kind of model is very powerful. It's kind of a very general tool. But we, th we just want to build good user experiences for people and this is one we could deliver so there's no reason not to get out of that. Thank you very much, everyone.
Thank you so much. Aaron, could you take pictures for me? Thanks. All right, our next guests want to introduce themselves. So they probably need no introduction. But come on up. Will, Norm? Hello. Hello. Hi there. All right, Will's plugging in. Um, this is Will. Maybe. I don't know. There's a video, but it doesn't matter. And uh, I'm Norm, and well, thanks for having us, first of all. Yeah, so um, I was going to say, this is Will, I'm Norm, I run a website called uh, Tested, it's a website and YouTube channel um, that maybe some of you may have heard of, but Will and I started it about six years ago, really to cover, you know, technology, and uh, where the interesting places where art and technology and the maker community intersex and one of the emerging technologies that we quickly gravitated toward of course was virtual reality and we've been very privileged over the past couple of years to be able to really ride shotgun with the hardware developers and software developers you guys out here are working and discovering what's interesting about this space um, but VR is real it's here you know the hardware is shipped and one of the reasons we're here and I'm here is to uh, hear from you guys see your demos and really bring to our audience uh, what you guys are working on so uh, even if I don't see you get to chat with everyone tonight, um, our email is right here, so feel free, please email me, norman at tested.com. If you want to show us anything, we'd love to have you in our offices, check out your demos, we're in San Francisco. Um, and one of the other reasons I'm here is that we also have a live show, a live event coming up. Um, it's our third annual show. Uh, this year it's called Tested Journeys. It's actually next Saturday at the Castro Theater in San Francisco. It's part of the Bay Area Science Festival. And um, it's this 90-minute show we put on every year, bringing interesting makers and people working technology to the show to talk about their projects. And uh, this year, specifically to show you guys some of the interesting places we've been, places whether they're physical, conceptual, or virtual. Um, and for that, I'm going to take it over to Will yeah, okay. to talk about the virtual environment we'll be visiting. So, um, if you guys don't know, I, I, about a year ago now, I quit Tested, which is my favorite job of all time, to start a, a VR startup, and I bet probably a lot of people here um, had similar urges. Uh, and what we built is a way to basically do performance capture in VR using just a Vive or Oculus Touch, three points of data, using IK and Beam algorithms and a bunch of really terrifying math, um, uh, to, to, do, to animate characters and then record those performances and play them back for people. Because we wanted, I wanted there to be an easy way for people to do live type studio, uh, live television type studio uh, performances in VR. So uh, for the second time live on stage at the Foo, at the Tested Show next weekend, we're going to do a live uh, Foo performance with me, Norm, and Adam Savage. We're gonna do a special episode of Still Untitled, which is the Adam Savage podcast. We do it every week. We've built avatars, we've digitized a bunch of Adam's favorite props. Uh, this is a Blade Runner blaster from the, what, 1981 classic? Is that right? 84, Blade Runner. Um, this next one is the Maltese Falcon. This isn't actually one of Adam's sculpts. He's famous for doing it. He did a, a talk at EG years ago um, that some of you have probably seen. Um, and we came in, we laser scanned a bunch of his props. We're going to pick them up. We're going to tell stories about his stuff. We're going to do it in VR on the stage. Uh, oh, there's one more. This is the Fertility Idol from Raiders of the Last Ark. Um, anyway, uh, I've already talked about how Foo works. The upshot is... Uh, when you watch this at home, then you get an experience like this. Where you, some of you probably tried this. It's on the Vive and Oculus Home. Uh, we'll be on PSVR at some time. Uh, and you can pick up stuff. You can look at it. And more importantly, you've had this kind of recorded social experience where, uh, well, eventually he'll turn around and uh, you'll see some other avatars that are walking around. I bring people into video games and then interview the developers inside the game. So you have these kind of shared experiences with, with quite frankly, janky avatars that, that are good enough for our purposes. <laughs> Um, so we did this a couple of weeks ago, a couple, I guess last month at XOXO in Portland, uh, with Brendan Chung, who made a game called Quadrilateral Cowboy. We did it on stage. So we have a really interesting performance where the physical performers and the virtual performers are in one-to-one -one space and you can see the virtual on the background in the projector. Um, and it's, it makes for some really interesting, weird moments, like where I clean Brendan's ears with a, um, you know, let's see if we can roll that one again. Uh, with a piece of bamboo. Uh, it's a weird show. You, if you like VR, you'll probably like it. You should come out. It's a, there's like a 75% chance that everything will work really well. Um, and uh, I guess that's pretty much it for us. 
Um, so it's uh, October 29th at 7 p.m. at the Castro. You can get tickets at testedjourneys.eventbrite.com if you'd like to come. We'd love to see you there. And I think Norm and I are going to hang out afterwards if you have questions or want to chat. Uh, we'll be here for a while. So cheers. Thanks for having us, guys. And if you didn't get that link, it's posted on the Facebook group. I think we tweeted it. You, you can find it. And um, so, yeah, great. So I think now we're going to uh, move on to a few community announcements. Uh, we're going to keep those kind of short this time because we want to get the demos and mingling. Uh, as some of you may know, the last couple of weeks have been like super amazing for the VR community. We mm -hmm. had Oculus Connect two weeks ago. There was the, the Immerse Conference last week. There was Steam Dev Days last week. VR on the lot last week. Uh, the W3D Conference was this week. Uh, so many things happening. PSVR launched. We got one in the office. Now we just need a PS4 to play it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I, I did sit down and I plugged into PS3 and I because you can actually just plug in an HDMI source. So I got to play PSVR and it was um, underwhelming because I used a PS3. Yeah. <laughs> but it was pretty cool. I but played that. It was fun. Um, so yeah. Anyway, we have uh, a few community announcements, but before we get to that. Uh, just a couple questions on that. Quick survey. Just curious, how many of you ordered, pre-ordered, received, bought a PSVR? It's like looking for the market penetration number here. Actually, All right. that's pretty good. Yeah. How many of you have a Vive? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. yeah. How many of you have an Oculus? All right, pretty good too. Right. Look a little more Vive. How oh, many have all three? <laughs> yeah, my people. <laughs> All right, so um, what else do we want to ask? Anything? Yeah, I think that was that was it. I was very curious about okay, that. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're, we're curious about that. How many of you are planning to get a PSVR as soon as the PS Pro comes out? Is that the big holding point? Yeah, that's me. It's on order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all right. Then we'll get those numbers will even out a bit. Uh, so we're going to announce next month's meetup pretty soon. We had a little, we were going to announce it tonight, but got a logistical hitch. Cause it, might be, it might be good. It might we'll be just a, say that. It might, it be, might be an amazing meetup, so... <laughs> Clear your whole month of November. Keep it open. For <laughs> um, yeah. and, and Thanksgiving, uh, too. Yeah. Thanksgiving, too. <laughs> VR and Thanksgiving. Um, and just an announcement. We did announce dates last month, just in case anybody missed it. March 20th, 31st, our big conference next year, San Jose Convention Center. Nobody go on vacation. Everybody go there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. We'll um, be opening up the call for speakers by the next meetup, definitely. So if you are, if you want to speak at SVVR, get ready, you know, write your little uh, description and and um, make your case because we will, we, last year we had something like 300 um, applications and I'm sure we'll have a lot more this year. But we do want you to speak, especially those of you who are a part of this core community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and on that note, because we've noticed now that consumer VR is here, the demographics of our meetup groups are changing a bit. And please don't be shy. I would like to know if this is like your first time at a VR meetup. Raise your hand. Yeah. Woo! All right, welcome. Woo! welcome. Woo! We were talking about this earlier today. There are, there's kind of two communities within our community. There's the people that have been here for all 34 meetups, <laughs> like me. And then there's the people who are new. And we love you guys. We've been doing this for you guys to get to this point. Um, but to give you a little background, because all of us old school people kind of know what to do, just like start talking and networking and solving problems. Um, this, this room is full of VR entrepreneurs, uh, innovators, experts in every field you can imagine. Um, you know, everybody pretty much wearing an SVVR t-shirt probably is one or knows somebody who is one. So by all means, stick around after the talks. The meetup is not about the talks. Those are kind of the warm-up acts and get great information. But the real heart of it is people talking to each other, doing demos, asking questions. There are no dumb questions. Um, and if you're an old school VR person and somebody comes up to you and asks you a question that you think is, they should know, they're new. Be nice to them. We've been doing this for them to get everybody into VR. So um, please stay around, mingle, form a company. There's, there's investors here. There's people who are hiring developers. Do it. So yes. well, and, and all internet, and you just want to show it off to people. But um, we do have an open demo policy. If you're bringing a vibe, just try to give us a heads up because they interfere with each other, and we have to plan out where to lay them out. But um, we'll make it fit somehow. So please bring demos when you come to SVDR. We love demos. This is all about the experience of getting in there. So um, the more demos we have, the better it is for everyone. All right.
All right, all right, quick, um, quick community, community announcements. announcements. I know we have Suzanne. a bunch. Suzanne. <laughs> uh, so uh, can I see a quick show of hands? Who here would like to learn how to develop for VR? I know we've got a lot of new people. And you're like, there's stuff I need to know. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two different educational things that I'm involved with. So the first of which is the AR VR Academy, which is a nonprofit that Liv and I and also Erin, who is here somewhere, uh, we founded together to um, help with diversity in the VR space. So we do classes in person in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, LA, New York, a bunch of other places. So if you're interested at all in um, learning a little bit more about that, you can go to our website at arvracademy.io. And we're also going to be helping out, um, hopefully, with uh, partnering with SCVR coming up in the future to do a few more things. So um, just be aware that that may be happening soon. Woo! Second of all, completely different thing that I'm involved with is um, Udacity just announced their VR Nano degree, and um, it opened this week. So I'm one of the course developers for the Nano degree. So if you're interested in learning VR in a, a different way, so online through videos and quizzes and projects, you can go look at the VR Nano degree and see if that's a fit for you. So. Uh, that's all I have to say. So, learn VR. Do some Woo! VR things. Hey, I'm Shannon. Um, so, I just got out of a two-day uh, committee Sorry. with uh, W3C talking about bringing web VR into a standard. And uh, there's good promise that that's going to actually happen. So, the hope is to be able to actually author VR content in HTML native-ish looking syntax with declarative syntax and you know say CSS uh, transforms applied to it so that we all can develop uh, VR content with tools that we're familiar with. Of course this crowd is more Unity and Unreal type guys but I think bringing VR to the masses of all the web developers in the world is an important initiative to uh, to undertake. So uh, to that end, uh, so I host a Silicon Valley WebGL meetup, WebGL slash WebVR meetup, and uh, our next meetup is going to be actually only in, it's in February, and it's going to be at VRDC up in San Francisco. We're going to co-host with, uh, there's a San Francisco uh, WebGL group as well, and uh, we hope to have some, some uh, updates as far as from the W3C, as far as how the spec's coming, and of course we'll have some amazing WebGL uh, demos and uh, speakers at the at the meetup. So if you guys are interested, look at meetup.com. Uh, SD WebGL is be the URL for it. And uh, see you in February, I guess. Hi, I'm Mike from AMD. And as some of you know, I'm working on a project called Project Loom at AMD. And what it is is a video stitching uh, toolkit so companies like Jaunt, or if you're building your own camera, or you're building tools, you can use this. It's now live on GitHub. It's all open source. And just so you know what it does, uh, currently today, if you're trying to do live stitching, you might be able to get four cameras stitched in real time, maybe six. With Loom, you can get 12 cameras, 16, even 24, 4K cameras, and all on one CPU and one GPU. So, see me if you want more information, or if you're good at Google, you can find it on GitHub. Thank you. It's time for the Mickey Show. Of course. Good evening, SVVR. Uh, this, this is your 34th meetup. It's our fifth straight month at SVVR, and uh, we're getting more and more excited. So, I'm Mickey, co founder of Nflux, and we make motion capture clothes. So, one of the biggest needs in VR right now for the complete experience is to have a body. You have a head, you have hands. We make clothes that let you fill in the body. And I'll just show you quickly how this works. So it's kind of like Iron Man. You power up your shirt. Power up your pants. <laughs> yes, sir. And now I'm just connecting to this live character of myself on this tablet here. Yeah, right. <laughs> so this character, there's little IMU sensors built into my clothes 
that track everything my body does without using a camera. And it's connected to my tablet right there. You can see there's actually a 3D scan of my head. Uh, we've got a, a, a Vive demo over there. You can try on the shirt, play a VR dancing game. And then three big, announcements, three big announcements from NFLUX right now. We are hiring for a full-time content developer to create dancing games, martial arts games, any kind of game you can imagine in VR where you would want to move your body. That's first announcement, content developer. If you're looking for work or if you know somebody, we're, we're you know, looking for the best content developer we can get. And second announcement is we are planning a hackathon for early December. So if you're interested in creating an experience you know, over a weekend in early December, come see us, sign up. And then third announcement is we're doing a VR survey to figure out what kinds of experiences you guys want in VR with our clothes. You start taking our surveys, you get up to $50 off the clothes. And they're going to retail for around $300, $50 off to anybody who takes our quick surveys. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Okay, last two. Hi. Um, we've been invited to demonstrate our game at AlienCon next weekend. It's kind of like a bunch of aliens <laughs> and TV stars and stuff like that. So if anyone's interested in helping us out for a few hours, uh, we have exuberant passes and you know you can attend the rest of the event for the rest of the weekend. If, uh, just get in contact. Thanks. All right. Need help demoing. Okay. Last, last one. Nice one. All right. Great. Hey everybody. My name is Nick Wallace. I am CEO of DataViz VR. And we are the first uh, VR data visualization tool, uh, and we're shipping actually this holiday season with the HTC Vive and the Oculus Touch. So definitely uh, come try our demo. We're really looking forward to showing you guys kind of the future of big data and uh, get to see your data in a whole new way. You really start to feel your data and interact with it. Um, come check us out. We're right over there in the middle between the two Vives. Um, we have the Oculus Touch, and we're, we're really excited to show you guys what we've been working on. Thanks. So, real quick, I just had two brainstorms while everyone was talking. One, the last two weeks, I don't know if you guys follow the news, but there uh, is, if you're developing content or thinking about developing content, there is an abundance of funding flowing into VR development. Oculus announced a you know, total $500 million investment in VR content, uh, broken up in various ways. I know HTC has a $500,000 um fund set aside for people to put content on their Vive store. Uh, we just posted something about